I am not a psychologist. I am not a therapist of any sort. I am not a psychiatrist. You know, I'm, I'm not even a social worker. I'm a sociologist, and I'm interested in how a diverse liberal democratic society deals with this diversity in a variety of policy domains. And uh, so I mean, I start from the big picture, and then I'm going to apply some of these questions to the area of mental health and social services. So, you know, um, imagine we have a Fredonian minority, right? I made up Fredonian. Imagine we have a Fredonian minority, and they're forced to live within a fully Fredonian space. Fredonian daycares and schools, Fredonian hospitals, Fredonian neighborhoods, Fredonian operated stores, Fredonian political parties, you get the idea. This would represent a kind of apartheid, right? Fredonians in their own space. On the other hand, suppose the Fredonian group would prefer such a form of voluntary segregation, or at least many of the group would prefer that option if it were available. To what degree should such choices be facilitated by a liberal and democratic uh, society, some kind of self-segregation? And to what degree should such policy decisions be informed by objective outcomes for such interventions, let's say as measured for the Fredonian population, or clients, or patients, or students, or whatever term you want? So, and what would the role be for the, for, for the preferences of the Fredonian professionals, uh, people like the people in this room, who will become their quote unquote Fredonian professionals in the area of mental health care, et cetera? What role do they play in deciding how this ethnic match should or should not work? And by ethnic match, let's take a quick look at what this could uh, be. So this is a configuration of ethnic match in a variety of public policy domains. What you see there can work for health, all health, social services, education, media, politics, crime, criminal justice, the courts, etc. And there's a literature in all of these domains, right? So, and uh, as I conceptualize this, you can imagine a scenario of sort of maximal ethnic match where you have a Fredonian professional working in a Fredonian ethnic uh, setting of some sort and practicing a kind of professional care that is Fredonianly culturally sensitive, right? That would be maximal ethnic match or, to, you know, to be, and now obviously if this were sort of voluntarily agreed to, we would have a kind of benign apartheid system, right? As opposed to a nasty kind of apartheid system. This one would be benign. People are choosing to live in their silos or their ghettos or their communities, whatever term you want to, to, to use. And then we have minimal ethnic match, which is no, no, no. No, we have, you know, we're all professionals equally. And, and we don't need these ethno-specific organizations or settings. We don't need them. A Fredonian clinic, what's that? We don't need that. Okay? And we certainly don't need to complicate our scientific approach with <clears throat> Fredonian cultural traditions, which are backward anyhow and non-scientific. Right? So that's no, no, no. Now, some people may think that this is a new problem, but actually you can find its roots going back 200 years to the, to the French Revolution and the debates about the Enlightenment and the tensions between what you call the universal and the particular. And how much should a modern liberal democratic society, which believes in equal citizenship, which you know, citoyen, the French Revolution believes in that. How much space do you want to carve out for a minority group within that universal system? Okay, the, the kind that John Stuart Mill would, would have proposed. You know, and he, he, a lot of that liberal tradition was very worried about what they called factions. You know, you don't like factions. You like the individual, and you like the state, and you like nothing in between. The sociological problem, of course, is that for many people, life is in between. Right? We have mediating institutions called communities and what have you that are in between the individual. All right. So that's the big, big uh, picture. And um, 
in, in, in some work that I did about 15 years ago, we find, uh, this was here in Montreal, that uh, if you ask minority origin professionals what they think about this idea of ethnic match, uh, many of them will cite possible advantages of uh, ethnic match, possible advantages. Uh, first and foremost, of course, language. Right? We have a diverse society. People are speaking languages. You have to be able to communicate in whatever the policy domain. So language is one uh, clear uh, benefit, if you will. Uh, then you have this thing called trust. By the way, these came from the, from the responses of our interviewees. Trust. Now trust, you know, how do you engender trust in a client or a patient so that they will, let's say, be compliant or that you'll have a therapeutic alliance? How do you do that? And, and I suppose there's two ways. One is by who you are. So if you're a Fredonian person and your client is a Fredonian person, then you may have some ab initio bond of trust. You can't teach that. You cannot teach that. We are who we are. So that's, that's one issue. And the second um, way, of course, is to try to teach it. Try to be em empathetic, try to be considerate uh, uh, in, in this way, to engender that trust. That's the initial bond in the dyad. A third, of course, what came out is cultural competence. And this is a kind of more of a fact-based kind of thing. You have to know something about the person that you are dealing with. So if you're dealing with a Fredonian patient or client, you must know something. It may, it, you must know. It can be helpful to know something about this person, their culture, their background, their historical context, where are they coming from, a whole range of, of items. Um, so those are possible clear advantages. Now, in, in our research, we also came up, surprisingly, with some uh, possible disadvantages of ethnic matching. So, you know, we assume you have a Fredonian patient and a Fredonian uh, a professional. But what about the intersectionality that goes on? You know, we just heard a wonderful talk about, the, you know, the, the Indian population. So what about the caste within the, the, the Indian professional and the Indian patient? And this applies for every group. Male, female, gay, straight, upper class, lower class, region, religion, the list goes on. So simply by having some sort of ethnic match, you may not necessarily have the kind of social match that you think. There's intersectionality that exists both for the clients and for the professionals. What do you do? You know, how, 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 so how, how fine-tuned do you want to make the service? So, in, so you'll have a South Asian family service, but that's not good. How about South Asian male and South Asian female family service? Well, what about Hindus and what about Muslims? How fine-tuned can it be, should it be? Right? That's the question. Then, of course, you have issues of confidentiality. You find in the field that if it, you know, people don't want their personal laundry uh, washed in front of, of their others in their community. So the Fredonian patient is, might be worried that if they speak to the Fredonian clinician or, or therapist, the word will get out. Or if they walk into the Fr Fredonian clinic, may happen right here in this building, the word will get out to people in their community. Let's keep it quiet, all right? So that's another uh, problem or issue. And a third kind of issue that raises its head is the feasibility of this entire operation in a liberal and democratic society. Constraint. Do we want to constrain, cajole, bribe, persuade, uh, direct, the Fredonian patient or yeah, client to a Fredonian practitioner? Do we want to persuade, motivate, cajole uh, the Fredonian professional to specialize in a Fredonian clientele? It's a great niche, right? I am the expert, I am the Fredonian uh, professional, and I have the expertise in the Fredonian clients. Send them to me. I know what to do, right? So that's um, a dilemma. You know, 
Uh, if you look at the literature, for example, in the United States on the shortage of, let's say, black physicians, the subtext is overwhelmingly clear that we have to have more black physicians to, to work with black patients, preferably in the inner city. Well, does every single black physician want to work with black patients in the inner city? I don't know. But you see that that's the issue of constraint. I also mentioned that a low threat of racism, and that's interesting because when you get out in the field and you speak to some of the Fredonian professionals, you will find, surprisingly, that they may have some negative and stereotypical views of their own Fredonian patients and, and, and clients. Un unexpected, but there you have it. And I'll give some examples of that later on. So, with my uh, research assistant there, uh, who's uh, sitting right there, Gabriel uh, Jacobs, we decided to ask a different kind of question, which is, okay, so all of this is in the area of hypothesis. What are the results? What are the outcomes, finally, of sustained ethnic match treatments? Do they work? Do they make the patients or the clients better than the alternatives? And is there any consistent pattern of findings? that we can look at, that we can find, and say, well, you, you know what? On balance, they do work. A matching will have a better outcome, assuming we can agree on what the outcomes ought to be, which is another whole talk, which you can't get into. But assuming we can agree on the outcomes, let's say for the patient, what works? Simple question, what works? By the way, I would pose the same question if I were doing this analysis for a school system, for education. You know, are the Fredonian children learning their math? Yes or no, better with a Fredonian instructor or in a Fredonian school, right? And assuming, you know, you want to find out if that's the case, what works? Because the assumption is there's some inequalities that we want to address, right? We're, we're motivated, we're motivated in this exercise by a sense of equity and justice. We want some equal outcomes for this minority group, the Fredonians. So what will work to equalize the outcomes? So we try to look at a variety of uh, studies. And um, interestingly enough, let me just, uh, all right, so what are some of the outcomes for both the perceptions, because that's a lot of the research has to do with perceptions, right? How do the various uh, Fredonian professionals or whatnot perceive themselves, how do Fredonian clients, do they want a Fredonian, what is their perception? I will be better off with a Fredonian therapist, right? What's the, that's the perception and the actual outcomes. Can we find some actual outcome measures? And if you look at a number of meta-analyses and reviews, by the way, there's a, a full paper here, so I'm not going to present everything from the paper, but I, I'm glad to send people some of these Findings, and this is all preliminary, even though these are meta-analyses with lots of studies and all the, there are so many studies, lots of studies. Um, you know, I'll be glad to send you that. Just let's give you a um, Carlson, one uh, meta-analysis. I'm gonna do this very quickly. Found that, that, that ethnic match has mixed effects on outcomes for all ethnic groups, except African-Americans where it's uh, more positive, okay? Now, this is uh, Carlson. However, this conclusion is contested by another uh, study by uh, Farsimidan et al., uh, who hold that, uh, quote, very few studies find no effect of ethnic match on therapy, on therapy, on therapy and uh, they find that uh, ethnic match tends to reduce dropout, increase retention, and also facilitate positive outcomes at least for some ethnic groups, again, for which ones? For some ethnic groups, and especially when associated with language matching. Cabral and Smith, in another uh, meta-analysis review of racial ethnic matching, find, for example, in 52 studies, uh, you have, part you have a participant preferred eth racial or ethnic match, a strong, a moderately strong preference for therapists of the same race or ethnicity. That's a preference. In 81 studies on client perception of therapists, clients demonstrated a slightly more positive perception of therapists of, the, of their own race or ethnicity. Uh, however, when you look at the outcomes of the therapy, the actual outcomes of the therapy, uh, 
they're negligible effects. So 53 studies are out there, and, and this meta-analysis finds, quote, negligible effects on the outcomes. Now, obviously, these are 53 studies. You have to unpack them. So I'm just reporting on these kinds of findings. Um, so there's no clear pattern that emerges from these meta-analyses of a large number of studies. Now, most of these studies are, of course, in the United States. And so there, you know, we can't go into it, but the conditions are different. The healthcare system is different. The roster of minorities are different. But again, most of the studies clearly are American. There are some from uh, Britain and Australia. But again, these are all contextual uh, factors. Um, so in terms of client outcomes, one area of positive finding, pretty much, is a sig significantly higher overall working alliance between the patient and the, uh, the therapist. So there's a stronger bond on that, sco on that uh, score. But you may have a stronger alliance with the therapist, but uh, ethnic, uh, no clear relationship with the outcome or the actual recovery stat status. So uh, language is generally found in every study to be important. So there's no debate on the importance of language. <clears throat> Again, some of the studies found what I mentioned before. The ethnically congruent therapists and professionals had some negative stereotypes about their own group. So for example, uh, in, in one qualitative study uh, of Mexican and Vietnamese patients, the patients perceived their cultural brokers and the same uh, ethnic origin health workers to be rude and distant. Who knows? Who knows what's going on, what that means in the actual dyadic encounter? But there you have it. And in fact, let me just try to uh, indicate some of uh, this kind of, of finding with a few quotes from, in this case, ethnic mismatch more successful. So here you can see that there's a Celia, mother of three in her 30s, pregnant single woman, but she, rec she recalled that a non-Hispanic staff person right, uh, reached out to her and encouraged her to affirm her pregnancy, telling Celia that her pregnancy was a beautiful thing. So this was a case where ethnic mismatch seemed to be leading to a positive uh, relationship with the therapist. Uh, this woman was really there to support me and to help me feel confident to understand what I did really wasn't so bad. So that's a case of ethnic mismatch, which is more successful. Ethnic mismatch can also be unsuccessful. And um, in this case, I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. There's a, a black gay man recounts his experience with his white Jewish therapist, uh, who is a, a, a woman. I guess her being a Jewish woman and my being a black man made it a little difficult because sometimes growing up in an African-American community, my grandfather was a minister. You're expected to act a certain way. And she didn't have firsthand knowledge of that community. Uh, she only had secondhand knowledge. And so you can read this quote, and uh, you know it, it's uh, you know it, it's clear that there is a problem here. And, and when she says, you know, I know a friend, or I have a friend who is black, you know, that's one thing a black patient doesn't want to hear uh, when they're in, in therapy. And, but that's what I heard. Okay. So now, what about the other issue of ethnic specific settings? which is different necessarily from the, pa the patient professional. In other words, let's ha imagine the Fredonian Clinic or the Fredonian Social Service Agency. And usually in the literature, these are defined as clinics or institutions where the majority of the patients are Fredonian and the majority of the professionals are Fredonian. Now, they, and generally they're probably run by or sponsored in part by a Fredonian community, but probably the government may play a role as well. So there, um, you get, I think, more of a positive set of outcomes. 
there may be something about the safe space of this kind of a setting that, um, that, that does have a positive uh, outcome. And we, we found several studies that, that show that. Let me just get some quotations here. This is a survey of, uh, from Asian Americans, United States, using an Asian American institution, ethnic setting. And you know, it, it's interesting. It's, it, there it is. Right? They felt good about going there. Right? You know, I feel very comfortable here. It's like a family. Right? It's like a family. Where do you get family in a large, uh, impersonal medical institution? It's hard. Right? I trust the workers. Remember I spoke about trust. Remember? I trust the workers. They treat me like a brother or sister. There is bonding and trust between us. I love the services provided by the clinic. In the past, I felt depressed, etc. I hurried up to see the bilingual psychiatrist for therapy and counseling. I was really comforted and left their office happy and confident. So there is something in particular about the space, the, the entire environment, the context of receiving the care that may play a role here. Now, whether this applies, for example, to a Fredonian school, I don't know. The evidence isn't that clear, but you get the idea of this is a warm, welcoming, supportive kind of uh, space. And these settings are also uh, very positive for Canada's indigenous peoples. If you look at some of the literature on aboriginals, there's an important sense in which uh, having treatment in a safe space, preferably with an aboriginal caregiver of one sort, may also have a positive outcome. Um, you know, living on the reserve is a different way of life, a different way of thinking. Maybe some needs are different. A lot of people I talked to in the past who were counselors, these would be non-Aboriginal uh, counselors, they didn't understand certain things. That seems like a part of your life when you're on the reserve. It's a different way of thinking. Okay? So there is some positive um, relationship there. Um, So basically, there are a number of studies that uh, uh, now it's interesting. Here, I, I, I look at some of the professionals' attitudes. For these are the therapists' view. What do the therapists feel about this? How much time? Five minutes. I'll wrap up. How much do the what do the therapists feel about this? Well, here's a, a statement from a a uh, one therapist, uh, and um, uh, this is a black physician. And clearly, there's a perception that, these, uh, uh, th that this person can provide better care to a black patient. That's what the person thinks, and that's what the person thinks that their patients think, that the black patient thinks. All right? It's a black physician. However, it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. Uh, here is a profession, professional of a Middle Eastern origin, uh, you know, the problem comes, we'll try to use ethnic match as an advantage, they will try to, you know, here's some sort of negative stereotypes about, quote, the Middle Eastern mentality, said by Middle Eastern profession, all right, about their own people. There is bargaining, they will try as hard as I can, the Arab community is not large, you know, there are a lot of threats to my life, you know, who knows what the issue was, but you can imagine some serious family issue, perhaps family honor was at stake, and therefore you get a very tough situation. You see what I mean? So you can't always be certain. So in conclusion, this is a preliminary review trying to find out, does ethnic match work? In what way does it work? All right? And I think what you can see there is that there are mixed results from ethnic match and mental health outcomes. It may depend on the case, it may depend on the group, all right? There, there may be mixed results, and also the subjective attitudes of patients or clients may differ from the more objective outcomes. For example, some of the studies have used hospital records. You know, hospital records, it's more objective. So, you know, it depends what the data source is. Clearly, intersectionality 
within minority groups and mass professionals may complicate successful outcomes. Right? We can't assume that's one size fits all for the Fredonian group. And I gave some very quick examples of that. Ethno-specific institutions seem to enjoy considerable success. Again, it's a final word, but they see, and you know, these have clear policy implications, which we can't go into now, in terms of funding and all sorts of other issues. And I would like to say, you know, at the end, the, the case for ethnic match in this domain, by the way, people assume, have assumed for years, that, that I'm a cheerleader for ethnic match. So the answer is a no, I'm not. I'm not a cheerleader for or against ethnic match. I would like to know what works and under what cases it can work, and then I'll decide for whom to cheer. So I, you know, I'm agnostic about this right now. Um, but uh, you know, there are broader political, social, and cultural considerations. So you know, I'll just end. You know, clearly, this conference, our, our thrust in this room tends to predispose us in favor of ethnic match. There's kind of that little bias we all share, all right? In favor of some sort of ethnic match, ethnic sensitivity, cultural competence, whatever term you want. So sometimes to be provocative, I say, from the point of view of the society, never mind the individual, never mind the professional, but let's say we want to promote anti-racism in the society, anti-racism, maybe what we need is ethnic mismatch. So we want a Fredonian professional to treat the non-Fredonian patient or client successfully and vice versa so that people will get a sense of the equality, the universal equality and competence of all peoples. Whereas the ethnic match paradigm may run the risk of keeping groups in their own silos, in their own spaces which may give them some benefits in terms of the micro level, but in terms of the macro societal level, it's not clear to me how far we want to go in that direction. So maybe that's food for thought. I think I'll stop, stop there. Thank you very much.